Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, or good evening. My name is Dr. Ed Rifa, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, The Road to COP26 and Black History Month. Um, I am a lecturer here at the University of Aberdeen, specializing in energy law, more specifically oil and gas and the regulation of offshore safety. Um, I am glad to be here, and this topic is one that is really, really close to me. So you can imagine my excitement when I was invited to part of the team to organize this event and as well contribute and share it more specifically. In today's event, we will be starting off with the welcome address that will be given by Professor Tavis Potts. Professor Tavis Potts is um, the interim director for the Center for Energy Law. He is specialized in Sustainable Development and, and the Interim Director for the Center for Energy Law at here at the University of Aberdeen. He is a professor that has specialized in a number of research international project grants and is um, currently here with us and happy to give us the welcome remarks. Um, professor Tavis Potts, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Eddie, and uh, it's a uh, it's a delight to to be able to welcome you all to this critically important seminar on the eve of COP26, where we hope and pray that the, the nations of, of the world can come up with a radical and progressive agenda to solve the climate crisis. There's a lot more work that needs to be done and a lot more ambition that needs to be raised around achieving our, our climate and any energy goals with Africa a key part of this process and a key voice in this process for, for going forward. I'd like to welcome our guest speakers today. I thank you for Professor Yinka Omorogbi and Dr. Kim, Dr. King Emily today. I'm really looking forward to hear your talks about the issues on the ground facing energy transition and climate justice in Africa. And just to reiterate both the the support of the Centre for Energy Transition here at the university. The Centre is really is built around inclusion and participation and interdisciplinary research for achieving energy transition on the pathway to net zero. And the Centre draws together a whole range of different disciplinary perspectives. We, we acknowledge and we recognize and we advocate that energy transition is not just a technical issue. It is, that is an important element, but energy transition is a, a, both a technical, a political, a societal, and a behavioral issue. It covers many different elements and all these things need to be in place for our societies to transform and undergo this journey on the pathway towards net zero. And we recognize the unique and distinct role that Africa has to play in this process as it faces issues around energy transition and sustainable resource development and the use of its resources to sustainably develop the communities on the continent to face the challenges around governance and institutions, particularly around energy and sustainability, and what is critically important to embed climate justice, democracy, and participation in the process and the great opportunities going forward. So I'd like to welcome all our speakers today. I'd like to thank Dr. Weefer for organizing this event. I think it's going to be very exciting. I'm looking forward to contribute and to answer questions and to hear some of the stories of change from Africa as we move forward into this new chapter in global politics around climate and energy. So thank you very much and I, and I look forward to today. Thank you very much, Professor Tavis Potts. The topic energy and climate crisis in Africa. We are drawing lessons from colonialism, sustainable business models, and resilient African communities. You could already capture from Professor, Professor Tavis's Potts um, introductory max, the social dimensions and the just social justice um, dimensions to the topic. 
The running order basically is following from that brilliant welcome remark. We will be having the key presentation by Professor Moribe, after which we will get a few insights from Professor Davis Potts again, and Dr. King will be giving us some more insights on sustainable business models, more from an economic perspective. Um, and then we would move over to the question and answer session. And we are graciously joined by Professor John Patterson, who would be giving the closing remarks. At this stage, I want to introduce you to the keynote speaker, Professor Yinka Omorigbe, S-A-N. Professor Omorigbe is a professor of energy law at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, currently doing a fellowship at Harvard University. She is also the chairperson of Edo Task Force Against Human Trafficking from 2013 to 2018. She was adjunct professor of Center for Petroleum Energy Economics and Law, CPEEL, University of Ibadan. She has previous been, previously been the secretary of the Corporation of Legal Advisor, Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NMPC, from 20, 2009 to 2011. She was the Dean of Faculty of Law University of Ibadan from 2005 to 2009 and the Attorney General of Edo State from 2017 to 2020. She is the President of the Nigerian Society of International Law and also the Nigerian Association of Energy Economics. At this point, you would agree with me that we wouldn't be in any better hands than Professor Yinka Omerebe to do some justice to the topic. At this point, I welcome you, Professor Yinka Omerebe, to share your thoughts on the topic for today, the energy and climate crisis in Africa, lessons from colonialism, sustainable business models, and resilient African communities. Over to you, Professor Yamaragui. Thank you very, very much for your kind introduction, and thank you very much for having me here. Um, I will try and share my screen. I just want to check. I hope you can all see my screen. So, um, Dr. Wefer has uh, already talked about, you know, given the title, the energy and climate change crisis in Africa, lessons from colonialism, sustainable business models, and resilient African communities. And um, I have to say that it's a huge topic. First of all, I'm very grateful to have been asked to speak to this fascinating topic, and I'll try and do the best that I can within this little um, time. Now, I'm talking about two of the world's most pressing problems at, the at a time when the world will shortly be gathering to discuss climate change down the road from you, really. And it's heavily intertwined with the problem of energy. And I've been asked to locate this discourse against the background of colonialism located within the context of emerging business models that should be applied to the amazingly resilient communities of, Af of the 54 countries of Africa. So my challenge is clearly to weave these different um, concepts together, but I have found that they are indeed related. And so it is my pleasure to speak on this um, topic. Um, I'll first just start off with something that's obvious but often overlooked, and that is that Africa is the second largest continent in the world. The Mercator map that we use doesn't make that as obvious, but this, um, this particular map, which is an alternative and interestingly being used by children in Boston, I don't know any other place, but this really makes a point. So you really see that three United States of America could fit in to um, Africa. It's great that this is Black History Month. It's a celebration of the race and it's a time to reclaim the written and spoken narrative of the Black race and its achievements and to challenge all the different narratives which I think are at best ignorant but actually I think sometimes have been intentionally mischievous because it was actually very very important for you to dehumanize whoever it was that you were on uh, enslaving. So really it originated in the United States through the effort of um, a man of many firsts, Dr. Carter Godwin Woodson. It's now celebrated in Canada, Ireland and the United, uh, and, um, the United States and in October in the UK and Ireland. It's really great and we're grateful. I think it's a great idea that um, we now have this period as one to celebrate and talk about blacks and its feet and the feats of the black um, 
black race. So I start off with this. I say we're the black historians because I have found in looking, particularly um, I will recommend people to go to the Young Historians Project. It is a, a UK-based project that is actually documenting the work of blacks in the medical field right now, but I know it's in different areas. But I found this as interesting statistics that we have very, very few black people that are even interested in history. But you can't really function well in the present and you can't dream about the future if you do not know your history. So it's really important. So, so to find that history is so denigrated amongst us is sad. But I know this is so. These are. Um, UK statistics, I think that in Nigeria, the statistics will not be too different because it is not a favored cause. But it's important for us to know who we are and what we are like, especially since our history has been told so badly by um, the colonizers and those who wanted to enslave us over the years. And so just for like one, two minutes, I'll just you know show you a little bit about that. There's a lot we have here. I mean, I, I don't have too much time. This is Adam's calendar. This is a way of telling the time, and it is um, in South Africa. There's a lot in Africa. If you go around Africa, you will see ruins of civilizations that existed thousands of years ago. This is the city of Aksum in Ethiopia. It's an old, ancient city. It's an old, ancient city that um, existed a long time ago. And this is the Great Wall of Benin. The Great Wall of Benin is, in fact, the greatest man-made wall that has existed. It dwarfs the Wall of China. <clears throat> but most people don't know about it. By the way, most of what I'm saying, I, pre I present um, references for. But I think that a lot of these um, issues are now getting better known. And again, this is another ruin that we have got. This time, this is in Mozambique, of a lost um, city in Mozambique. And this, I particularly love this. This is Mansa Musa, who is still now regarded as the richest man that ever lived. So, you know, it's not, um, who are the tech millionaires now? It's not Bill Gates, it's not Elon Musk, but it is Mansa Musa, who had this stupendous empire and who, seat of the, the seat of the empire was in Songhai and he's here in the Magellan um, Magellan manuscript right here and he's shown there depicted as a king with a crown and with um, a gold ball in his hand so these are known again documented um, facts it's also a documented fact that the modern world was built on slavery and slaves and again, I give a quote here that showed that um, slavery was the fundamental prop and support of Britain. The British Empire, he described as a magnificent superstructure of African commerce and naval power. And he actually went down to say, no African trade, no Negroes, no Negroes, no sugars, gingers, um, indicos, no, no islands, no continent, no continent, no trade. So this is you know, pretty obvious. So many things happened at this point in time and in my written paper, but there isn't time for that. And um, I, I make a point, there was a lot of commerce between Africa and Europe, and there was a lot of interaction interaction between the two, the two places. As a matter of fact, when the Europeans first came into contact with um, Africa, it was known as a very wealthy continent, obviously. That is why they were coming here. And they continued to trade. They continued to trade with us. And they continued to have great um, relationships with our leaders who went there for different things. In Benin, for example, as far back as the 15th century, the princes of Benin were being sent to Portugal to study and do different things. They did this as well in the different areas of, um, of um, Africa. And you'll find that it's shown in some places. For example, there is the picture, the Shafaris del Rey, which shows a black knight in a square right in the middle of the city center in Lisbon. And there's a lot of talk, the queens of Congo, etc., would go to 
would go to Portugal and be fitted in that area. But at the same time as all this was happening, slaves were being sold. These same people were actually selling, selling slaves at the same time. And very soon, <clears throat> colonialism came. And colonialism was totally for the purpose of developing and advancing the interests of the colonizer. It wasn't about developing the colonies at all. And therefore, um, and therefore, there were big issues here. But my point is that development in Africa was effectively truncated. And um, at the end of the day, we ended up with leaders, but leaders that um, have not been able to take us to where we have to be. But at this point, my perspective is that you just mentioned this. This is all history. We need to be able to rise above these various ills and chart paths of prosperity. So energy poverty. <clears throat> this has been a problem in Africa and is still a problem in Africa. And I put a picture there. That is not such a rare site. If you ever come to Abuja in Nigeria, I can take you 30 minutes down the road from wherever you are in the center of Abuja, you will see all these piles of firewood. So Africa is home to half of the world's poorest people and then five of the countries. Nigeria, I have listed them there, but Nigeria tops the list there. The corona pandemic has worsened the fate of poor people and has worsened energy poverty. <coughs> Excuse me, please. Has worsened energy poverty. It has actually thrown people down the energy ladder. People who were using LPG, liquefied petroleum gas, before have had to go down because of poverty, down to using kerosene and firewood. Extreme poverty and energy poverty are really um, linked. So this is a huge problem in the continent and something that has to be addressed. It is a huge problem all over the world, actually. Now, I note that the world is a bit more tuned to electricity access than it is to clean cooking. And I clearly say that this has a big gender dimension to it. And also, of course, it's premised on the fact that while the energy access issue has a lot to do with global warming and emissions, cooking is less so, but actually about four and a half people die each year from inhaling particulate matter. So that is a huge um, problem. This is another supposedly picturesque sight of um, a Gwari woman carrying firewood. These pictures should be history. It's just a problem that we have so many um, energy poor people. But we need to remember that when you combat energy uh, poverty, you're combating climate change, you're saving forests, and this also allows for the creation of more carbon sinks and reduces desertification. So we need to think that it's, you know, the climate is enhanced when you work in this um, area. I believe it has to be a part of the climate change solutions and we'll see what happens after the conclusion of COP26. Again, these are some other pictures that um, I'll bring up here. And I think that Dr. Wifa will be familiar with some of this if he goes home because this is some of the devastation you get when the oil industry is wrongly um, managed in some instances. And of course, the top, um, top left shows you, you see um, pollution mingled with um, em emissions going into the air in a place where there is no energy at all, where there is extreme energy poverty. So these are definitely very big issues. Why are we energy poor? Very, very simply. I believe that energy poverty is as a result of either poor energy planning or energy planning that does not put the common man or woman or person, in fact, I should have said common woman because <laughs> the woman is the one that suffers most here, but that does not put this common person as the main beneficiary of, of the plan or policy. And that is a reason why the grids of Africa are in the capitals and not the rural areas. Countries with 100% access planned for it. It didn't just happen. So now we have the big problem of climate change. It's a front burner issue. There's an energy transition in process. There's a lot of talk, and um, but there is no alternative. That is the truth of the matter. For the sake of the planet and for so many uh, um, 
for the sake of the good of us, for the good of our health, good of our well-being, for our futures, there is no alternative to renewable energy and to a net zero economy. So we now have COP26 down the road. There's a lot on with that, and I'm not going to talk too much about it. But it's supposed to be a meaningful conference with meaningful outcomes. It's looking for global, um, solid global commitments that will keep um, the world 1.5 degrees within reach. It's looking for adaptation measures for countries affected by climate change. And it's hoping that there will be at least 100 billion in finance, climate finance per year, so as to secure global net zero. It's also looking for international collaboration and um, cooperation. And um, like so many, we outweigh the outcome of the conference. So can the tensions between the overwhelming needs of both climate change and energy poverty be reconciled? I would say yes. And I'd say that at the end of the day, that is what the world is concerned about, even though right now, there seem to be rising voices from um, the developing world, from the petroleum producers saying, look, we have to um, basically still continue with petroleum, but we, because of the needs of the energy um, poor. And I talk about some, um, I note that the net zero um, document that came out in May, 2021, <coughs> excuse me, in May, 2021, provided for, um, talked about energy poverty in terms of energy access. And so I believe that it was talking in terms of opportunities and it still said that that was an integral part of their pathway. It didn't mention um, clean cooking. Clean cooking is a poor second, but in a sense much easier to deal with. I'm hopeful that that will happen. <clears throat> and in the world energy um, oil outlook, you can see that there's a bit of um, combative, well, I say uh, the uh, OPEC countries are a bit combative because you can, from the words of the OPEC Secretary General at the launch of the WOO 2021, he basically said that any talk of oil and gas being con uh, consigned to the past and the need to halt investments in oil and gas is wrong-headed. So if the necessary investments aren't made, it could have knockdown implications. And he talks, you know, I mean, I, I won't go on too much about that. And then again, these are some other quotes there. It's vital to tackle both climate change and energy poverty within the context of sustainable development and the UN Sustainable Development Goals with SDG 7 on ending energy poverty, calling for universal and sustainable access. So the energy transition, he, they say it's not about picking one energy over another, but in actual fact, energy transitions actually do mean that one energy source takes primacy over um, the other. We have the World Economic Outlook, and it came out um, not too long ago. It's clearly an uh, accompaniment to the COP. And I think that looking through it, it seems to tie all the different areas together. It emphasizes the great opportunities inherent in the change that is going to take place under the transition. So by the time one looks at um, all this, you can see that an international catalyst is essential to accelerate flows of capital in support of energy transitions and allow developing economies to chart a new lower emissions path for development. I think that this helps a lot because by the time you look, you will see that there's actually a lot of money that should be put in to make the lower emissions path uh, a reality. And a lot of this money will have to go into ensuring that those who do not have energy presently have it. So the solutions, I'm talking money now, but I have to say that the solutions are not all about finance. It's necessary for there to be strategic policies accompanied by laws that promote their objectives in the most affected countries that most need appropriate intervention. Without good policy and legal regulatory frameworks that are adhered to and implemented in the energy poor states, there's going to be insufficient financial and technical solutions flowing into these countries. Money does not go into places where there's great uncertainty. So strategic planning is um, key. Now, unfortunately, I have to give an example, and I won't talk to this um, slide because I think, I think the slide tells a lot. This is our um, 
basically energy framework in um, Nigeria. And um, you can see that there is a problem. There's just too much in it. There are too many entities there. And where is the, the entity that's supposed to be helping us with planning? It is the Energy Commission of Nigeria that is to the you know middle bottom middle right. So you can see that there are huge um, sectoral problems in this area that really should not be so. We actually should have something that amounts more um, amounts more to a flow. And I, I'm saying that there should in fact be a flow such as in this particular um, map here, a diagram which I had been working with for years. I have to say that the one before is directly from the Energy Commission, so from a presentation by the Director General, and I've put the reference there in, in um, behind. I've put the reference behind. So there actually should be a flow between policy, you know, national policy, sectoral policy, to the laws and to implementation. And then you have coordination and you have an environment that is at least um, welcoming. So what do we want? We need business models that can come into the ideal environments, business models that will grow modern energy access while the country aims for carbon neutrality or even reduce national emissions. This is definitely a possibility. An energy transition doesn't mean the end of petroleum of the petroleum industry. It means finding alternatives that align with protecting the planet. And this is where we need innovation and we need research. Business models can be really different, but what are some underlying premises? I believe that um, underlying any good um, model should be the realization that ending energy poverty is ending extreme poverty, and that is goal one of the sustainable energy goals. The objective has to be that nobody is left behind while working to receive a reduction in country emissions. We need to realize that both electricity and clean cooking fuels are important. I believe that this is a period of great opportunity, great opportunity for impact investors. And I don't think it's charity we're talking about because I believe that financial gains are certain in the medium long term. Maybe not as much in the beginning, but where you, when you push energy, throw energy to any community, the community is always enhanced. And I just give one case study, and this is a case study of 100% energy access in Morocco. Morocco is a very, very successful example. It's a utility-led electrification program. So it's not, um, in many places in Africa, there was privatization, but that hasn't helped much. In the case of um, Morocco, there wasn't that. But what was there? There was total government commitment and there was an alignment between government policy, law and implementation. The utility company was a major driver there in, in, the, um, in this process and they were determined to ensure that no one was left behind so remote communities were totally covered. They were very much, the business model was built around a financial sustainable private sector model with cross subsidies, direct public subsidies, and international debt. So it was a mixture and the government put their money in it as well. At the end of the day, they had all their villages that have 5% of their population. So not many people, but still no one left behind. That was their premise. And these were powered through diesel or renewable energy powered mini grids or photovoltaic um, kits via a service fee model. Their emphasis was actually very, very much on renewable energy. The grand total cost for rural electrification for about 10 years was 2.5 billion euros. So where there is a will, there is a way. It actually is very possible. And the solutions are so diverse. It really depends on the special needs of, what, of, of the particular community we're talking about. So this is really the time to come up with innovative business solutions that will stimulate energy access and end energy poverty. Different circumstances, different terrains will require different models. The right legal and regulatory environment is key, and this must be driven by a policy that includes all, no one left behind. And I have been sort of repeating that as a mantra because I think it is important and it's fundamental. 
And at the end of the day, I think most of us here, we're familiar with the energy industry and we know this map. And this is a map of Africa at night showing the darkness. In fact, I think psychologically, I went to pick one that was lighter than normal because many of them look much, much darker. Uh, one of the painful things is that the flares of Nigeria, uh, you know, some of the brighter lights here, we need to ha ensure that we have an Africa that is lit, an Africa that um, actually has energy. It should not be the dark continent from space at all. So images like this, and of course, images like those women, that um, the woman that I've shown you carrying firewood on her back, or the firewood, or all, you know, think of all the logs that are being cut because of energy. This image needs to become history, and so should um, that particular um, image. And thank you very much. These are the different resources that I have put there. And um, I definitely will be available to give more resources to people who might want um, who might um, want more. So with this, um, I will end my presentation and say I'm really very, very thankful. I'm really honored to have been asked to speak and to share for some minutes on this, what I think is a very, very important um, topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yinka Omorigwe SAN. Um, I certainly had no doubt that we were in very capable hands when um, you started your presentation. Your presentation does capture um, the depth of the topic and provides not just a, a historical context to the interactions between the global north and global south um, in such a way that demonstrates the interest of the colonizer and not those that were colonized. But ultimately, the presentation was quite sincere and left us with a lot of optimism. Um, and and the, the case of, of Morocco does demonstrate that it is achievable as long as we prioritize energy planning and people at the center. Thank you very much again. Um, at this point, I will be calling on Dr. King Omehe to share some insights on the talk, particularly from an economic and business perspective model. Um, Dr. King Omehe leads the Business School's Global MBA program. He advises startup businesses, leaders, and policymakers on entrepreneurship, innovation, and business resilience. His current roles include being chair of Africa Studies at the British Academy of Management, chair of entrepreneurship in minority groups at the Institute of Formal Businesses and Entrepreneurship, and members of the Africa Asia Center for Sustainability, which was established on the commitment to undertaking inter and transdisciplinary research. Um, I welcome. Dr. King to share his thoughts on the topic um, from an economic and business model perspective. Thank you, Dr. King, you're welcome. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Eddie. And thank you for Prof uh, Professor Yinka for that uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, it was quite informative, quite instructive. And I think it's a welcome uh, discourse you've actually um, identified here. Um, again, I'd like to also thank the organizers, thank Dr. Wifa and thank all the team. I think this is a welcomed, uh, um, um, welcome platform for us to discuss. Uh, from, from, on, on my part, from uh, maybe an economic perspective and an entrepreneurship perspective, I'd like to say that um, current research from the Brookings Institutions and New Climate Economy indicates that energy transition could actually generate at least $20 trillion in economic benefits over the next nine years, especially as it relates to Africa. And of course, this could also generate close to uh, about 65 billion of new low carbon jobs by 2030. And I would point that this could be combined to the, this could be uh, an equivalent of the combined workforce of uh, Egypt and perhaps the UK. But again, in terms of driving sustainable energy um, initiatives, you know, it would require some kind of ambitious action across economic systems, such as the role of the government to kind of create conditions to phase out coal and the rapid scale up of the renewable sector. And I think one of the most interesting things we started to see is some kind of large traction or acceleration in large parts of Africa. And uh, there's this amplified momentum in investing in shared electricity, low carbon transport in cities. Uh, we've seen governments trying to focus on landscape restoration and reducing emissions in, uh, across uh, industrial places. But of course, the impetus would also lie in the developed economies because they, as the biggest emitters, must also step up to also support Africa. But of course, Africa, again, should be able to prioritize 
and also take that robust advantage. Uh, if you look at countries, uh, just like Professor Yinka mentioned, like Morocco, uh, we're already seeing that kind of ambitious, sustainable business models. And in Morocco, what they've done, because I'm kind of familiar with some of their work, is that they, they've constructed the largest uh, constructed um, solar facility to kind of help achieve the country's goal of 52% renewable energy by 2030. I think this kind of also provides some kind of strong opportunities for job creation, for increased revenue generation for the economy, and also supports the country as it transitions away from fossil fuel industry. Again, I think another good lesson and a good, a good example is in South Africa, where they've also put in what we call the Carbon Tax Act. And this kind of places levies on greenhouse gas uh, for fuel combustion. And I think it will actually help them achieve their goal in 2035. So well, if you look at my own home country, Nigeria, with a population of 230 million people, with a growing, um, growing, growing youth, strong millennials, strong um, emerging entrepreneurs, Nigeria appears to be far away from achieving that renewable energy target by um, of 3% uh, by 2030. I think a recent report done by Okonjo Iwala and the Brookings pointed out that the goal for the Nigerian government should be driving renewable energy investments to deliver energy access and, of course, climate change benefits. Um, so I think there is scope for improvement. There is scope for that kind of accelerated momentum. And the goal is to look at how we can continue to provide energy to thousands of households on the continent, but of course, sustainable energy. And Nigeria, like Africa, is resource rich, and we should be able to tailor our effort towards renewables, energy transitions as a strength central part of our ability to achieve universal energy access. I'll stop there. I can see Dr. Wifa is already looking at me uh, with his left eye. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you, Dr. King. You do, you do capture the economic and business um, angle to the conversation, which I think is indeed essential because most of the arguments has been where would the money come from? And your, your presentation does capture a number of examples that demonstrate that um, there is a huge potential for energy transition and, and the shift to low carbon energies. Um, having provided those, those succinct um, 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 ideas, it's helpful to get a sense of what's happening in other parts of the world world, particularly in jurisdictions that are equally um, mature in terms of oil and gas um, exploration. At this point, I will be handing over to Professor, Professor Tavis Potts, um, who is a professor of sustainable development and the interim director of the new Center for Energy Transition at the University of Aberdeen. Professor, Professor Potts' interests include understanding just transitions and social dimensions of climate and energy, marine resources governance, national capital and ecosystem services in the coastal and marine system, and public perceptions and values in environmental decision making and governance. I will hand over to Tavis Potts to give us some insights um, from Scotland and other parts of the world on some of the social implications of energy transition. Over to you, Professor Tavis Potts. Thank you so much, Eddie. I'm just going to share my screen, uh, make sure you can see that okay. okay. There we go. I hope you can, everybody can see that okay. Thanks for, thanks for the chance to talk. I'm, I'm, I don't consider myself a, a, an African scholar. Um, but I have have worked particularly in in in, in South Africa um, around issues of, of coal. Um, I'm I'm an Australian. I, I come from a coal mining family. My father and my grandfather both worked in coal mines in the electricity system, and 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 some experience in in Ghana. And I'd like to also just acknowledge how much I've learned from. Uh, my two uh, Ghanaian PhD students, David Ayinatigo, who is just finishing up corrections and was some fascinating work on green economy transitions in Ghana, and, and Tracy Gotang, who is in her second year, uh, towards the end of the second year, looking at um, the impacts of community, small scale community smart grids in rural Ghana as well. I've learned a lot from my, my students in this space. And I, I first really fell in love with the continent 
on a, on a, a wonderful experience where I, I did fly, and I'll admit uh, in the past and, and, and in and possibly the future, I occasionally do have to fly for work, but I, I got the amazing opportunity to fly from uh, Scotland to, to South Africa to, to Cape Town in a day flight and, and a beautiful clear skies. The whole, I was, as a geographer, I was just fascinated to see from, 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 from Morocco through to South Africa, the diversity and the beauty of the continent and uh, uh, just such a fascinating, rich and diverse place. And I really fell in, fell in love with the continent on that, on that flight, seeing it from afar. I digress. I, I just want to give a few slides about a contrast, Scotland, what's happening here in UK and Europe, but also some reflections on just transitions in the African context. Now, I will go quite quickly through my slides over the next sort of five or six minutes. So energy is central to achieving the SDGs. It connects to everything from poverty, to education, gender, inclusive cities, managing our natural resources, partnerships and peace. Energy in some ways is one of the hubs that connects achieving the goals both in Africa and across the world. And we now have seen and hear about this agenda for, from the just transition, the process of achieving energy transition and, and a broader societal transition towards our goals, our global goals of, of achieving 1.5 degrees, aspirationally 1.5 degrees and we hear a lot of phrases consistently about what a transition means. It's, it is, I particularly like this, this interpretation from the Climate Justice Alliance, place-based set of principles and processes and practices. I think this is particularly important in the context of the diversity of the continent and the diversity of nations and regions and communities and individuals, but how we develop these processes. We've also heard that the, the call to leave no one behind and a transition needs to ensure that it is about including decent work, but it's also about social inclusion and democracy of having a say over the direction of it on top of our fundamental goal of the eradication of poverty. And I just want to highlight the point, two very different pictures here, one of both uh, similar, both are coal workers uh, this is a picture from Scotland in the late 70s, early 80s, where there were protests over the closure of coal mines, which decimated coal communities in, in the central belt in Fife. And those communities have still struggled to this day with issues of employment and deprivation over what was an unplanned and an unjust transition. And then the challenges to places such as South Africa today, where Coal mining is a huge employer, over 200,000 people, predominantly, predominantly low-income households in South Africa, employed in what is essentially a 100% a state-owned industry, but one that faces massive problems with energy security and how it transitions around coal. And this story can be replicated across many contexts and countries. You'll see a lot of ideas, different slides about what transition means. I think this is one of the better ones. I won't dwell on it for too long, except that it moves from this idea of an extractive economy with a particular set of views, purposes, and resources that is linear, that is about exploitation and consumerism and colonialism, and one that moves through to one that is a more regenerative or circular economy based on well-being and cooperation and democracy. Democracy, And this important bit down the bottom here, which I've kind of blown up for you here, I think this really some, is a good example of what a just transition means, apart from the sloganeering that you often use behind a just transition. It's actually about shifting economic control from centralized authority down to communities to, to advancing ecological restoration, justice in all terms and senses of the word, both climate and energy justice and also social justice. 
and to restoring cultures and traditions. I really think this is a powerful version of the just transition. So I flick back now to the UK context and where we're going and some of the challenges. This is both in the UK and in Scotland, we are facing massive change around energy transition. We are, we are forecasting a, 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 a quadrupling uh, of, of, of the electrical generation system to accommodate things such as the potential electrification of heat, uh, the electrification of transport and things such as electric vehicles. So the capacity of, of, of the power system has to grow massively. The area that I do probably most of my work is in offshore wind or, or marine based energy. And in the UK, our target is now 40 gigawatts by 2030. That's, that's a quadrupling of offshore wind from current 10 gigawatts. Uh, and, and in Scotland, uh, we have one gigawatt in the water. So we're going to see uh, 10 times capacity in Scotland of offshore wind. We're going to be looking at issues around reforestation of enormous tracts of land, uh, enormous amounts of zero carbon cars, production of hydrogen. We're in a huge transition in Scotland and and the UK. With offshore wind, for example, we see UK is actually the world leader in offshore wind. Uh, I know it's a topic Eddie's very familiar with as well uh, in, in terms of we have now 11 gigawatts uh, in the North Sea, concentrated there in the, in the Southern North Sea, which will be planning on growing and moving throughout the North Sea into those Northern parts. So a real innovative, industrial opportunity there, but one also that has a major just transition component. And Europe is planning to go big on winds. That's the message from this slide. By, by 2050, a much more diverse energy system, one based on 50% on wind energy, both predominantly terrestrial, but also offshore wind capacity. And enormous numbers by 2030, ambitions of, of 250 gigawatts of onshore and 70 gigawatts offshore wind. I can't emphasize how big, how much a massive change that is for both Europe and, and places like, like Scotland. As we see this changing workforce, on the left, we'll see jobs actually grow in the offshore energy workforce, but diversify away from oil and gas, the purple bar here. So probably a halving of oil and gas jobs, but an increase in, in things such as offshore wind, hydrogen, CCUS, carbon capture and storage. But we have major structural issues and problems in the industry, for example. For example, in the current offshore wind industry, we have a major gender imbalance and an ethnicity imbalance. 18% of women in the offshore wind and 3% of Black, Asian and Middle Eastern communities, employees in the industry, which I think is an absolutely shocking statistic and one that if it is a just transition, has to be open and accessible. I'm going to skip this slide, Eddie, in the interest of time for you, just to say that the distribution of benefits from the transition that aren't always even. Different groups, different places, different geographies have benefited from energy, even here in Aberdeen, one of the most wealthiest cities in the UK, but the distribution of those benefits have gone to certain segments of the population over others, and we still have really poor communities struggling in, in the most wealthy energy city in Europe. It's not a problem that's going away. So my last slide, where does this leave us in terms of a just transition? And we have a range of different just transition perspectives here. We're sitting at the top at the moment, which, which I like. This is actually from 350africa.org, a great little website looking at just transitions in Africa, Africa driven. I like this term, just a transition. That's where at the moment, uh, a narrow focus on technocratic and managerial issues, essentially swapping one industry from the other. Let's go from fossil fuels to renewables. But actually where we need to go and where this, this site advocates is that protective just transition as our baseline where fossil fuel dependent communities are protected in the transition. This is an emphasis on social support for energy workers, a big issue in South Africa, retraining, investment into communities that would be negatively impacted. But the gold standard is a transformative just transition where we're actually reimagining and remodeling energy, food production, housing, transport, minerals, and other sectors 
and an environmentally sustainable way, one that embeds social inclusion and ecological sustainability and economic success. This is about building a different kind of world that we want to live in. And that's the gold standard that we need to push towards both in Scotland and across the diversity and the beauty of all of Africa. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you very much, um, Tavis. That was, that was a, an excellent presentation. Um, you can begin to see the benefits of understanding how other jurisdictions are managing with energy transition. Um, at this point, we will be moving to questions and answers. Um, and so I would urge all participants, if you can, um, or if you don't mind, to put your cameras just so that um, we can see everyone. Um, so I'll bring back Professor Yinka Omorebe, SAN, and Dr. King Omehe. And um, the, the questions are already coming in. Um, so please keep on posting your questions in, in the in the Q&A box, um, and I'll do my best to take them. But I do have some preliminary questions for, for some of the pre pre presenters, starting with um, Professor Yinka Omoibri. Um, for one of the questions that I have seen um, over time, and, 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 and I think it's, it's in, it will be interesting to know your take, is do we redefine energy transition within the broader context of the global north and global south? That's one. And two, even within the African continent, do we need to further redefine energy transition um, between mature um, um, oil and gas dependent jurisdictions or in, and, and emerging um, oil and gas jurisdictions? So between say countries like Nigeria and Angola and say countries like Mozambique or Uganda who are just coming up, or is that just gonna be one energy transition for everyone? What, what's your take? Um, I will say what may be will not be a popular um, position, and I, I believe there has to be one, talking very, very frankly. I know that there is an attempt being made to reframe the conversation to a greater extent, but my fear is that talking about reframing in countries that are not planning correctly and are not strategizing correctly will simply lead to nothing being done or worse even worse outcomes so for me i think we need to keep it as it is but recognize that we have a huge challenge that has great opportunities within it and that is the challenge of growing without um, increasing your emissions it actually doesn't mean killing your oil industry completely it means cutting certain things down. It means killing gas flaring completely. It means stopping a lot of the things that have to do with uh, deforestation. It means starting to do research or ally, allying yourself with researchers who are, I mean, there's so much happening. So in a nutshell, my perspective is don't redefine it. If, if we were different, I might say, yes, redefine it. But very frankly, I've not seen that we are. Thank you, thank you very much for that sincere response. It's it, it's fine you say we shouldn't redefine it because there's absolutely not very much to work with or, or to even redefine in the first yeah. place. Um, Tavis, did I did I see you? Did you did you want to come in here? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. Um, I transitions, energy transitions, and just transitions by extension are different in different places. So I, I think in order to have some traction, both with with national sort of policy systems of governance and, and legal and policy systems, but also with with with, with communities and, and with sectors, then those transitions need to be interpreted into into what works for that 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 region, that place. So I'll give you the example of Scotland, and we're pushing into offshore wind as it was one of the mainstays of, of at least our, our power generation system. But that obviously will be different for, for South Africa. That will be different for, for, for Morocco or, or Ghana or Togo or anywhere we want, we want to travel around the continent. So it's really important to have that, that interpretation relevant to the place so the right policy instruments and the right economic levers can, can be put in place. But we are also, as we shift away from fossil fuels globally, and I still I do take the point that there's still room for decarbonized production of fossil fuels in countries that have not developed their resources, as opposed to countries that have long developed their resources. And that needs to come under a global agreement. 
But I think we're going to see a very much a new energy geography or new political economy emerge where success and economic success in energy isn't about actually who owns the resource. It's about who can access the sun, the wind, the waves and the tides and who can then capture that, convert that, use that and sell that. So Morocco is building a power pipeline to, 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 to Europe, for example, to export yeah. solar energy. So we're going to see a vastly changing political economy around energy. Africa can be the powerhouse of the world in this space if it, if it, if it, if it, if it, if it, it takes this opportunity. Thank you very much, Tavis. I mean, you do make a very brilliant point about the potential. Um, just to bring in Dr. King here, I mean... Dr. King, there's been this economic argument that um, point resources like oil and, and, and gas and, and coal um, is cheaper and easily um, accessible. And that has been the background behind the arguments that African countries should continue to exploit these resources. With the growing competition we see around solar and, and, and wind, um, do you think that argument remains sustainable? Well, well, thank you, Dr. Eddie. And I, I, I think first, Africa has a very strong economic argument for energy transition. And of course, they need to actually move from its reliance on oil. I think this is because firstly, for Africa, it could avoid close to 700,000 premature deaths as a result of um, air pollution. But more importantly, they stand to gain or stand to generate an estimated $2.8 trillion in kind of government reviews, revenues through subsidy reforms and carbon pricing. And, and again, if you look at the large corporates, they're already seeing this momentum, they're already seeing the future, and a lot of them are already diversifying their portfolios. And I think the private sector already shifting to renewables, but of course, more institutional support on a macro level is actually needed. I think some of the strategies that could be put in place is um, the introduction of some kind of competitive procurement strategy for electricity supply. And I think one of the bane of African ec economic development is the lack of sustainable electricity. So this can actually provide some kind of opportunity for sustainable energy, uh, more access and reduced pricing. I was going to speak about uh, sustainable models here, but maybe I could stop here, but I, 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 I can go on here if you, if you want me to speak on. Thank, thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be loads of opportunities for us to continue to engage with the subject. And I mean, I was talking to um, Tavis yesterday and we're, you know, this is something that is very close to our heart and, and should be getting some, some support or funding for. Um, so the questions are coming in and, and I see this one from um, Thomas Munzer and, and, that, and that's a colleague of mine. He says, Professor Yinka, thank you for a very insightful talk. And um, you point out very insightfully that over the course of this century's energy transition, we need to ensure that no one is left behind. Is there a risk, to the questions more specifically, is there a risk that if we are not careful, we will end up con reconstituting current energy inequalities in the form of new low carbon energy transition in low carbon energy systems. Could you say a bit more about how you think we can avoid the risk of going, the risk going forward? Uh, th thank you very much. I think that's really a great question. That is one of the reasons about my talking about one standard and not a lower standard for Africa or a different standard. I believe that when you're talking really about nobody being left behind, you need to realize that everybody has got to have a certain amount of energy. I am personally very critical of the basic so, uh, solar home systems because I believe that giving some people solar home systems and then giving some people full, full um, electricity that allows them to grow and develop is um, actually perpetuating an inequality. So not at all, but that is why I emphasize strategic planning. If you do have strategic planning, you will understand that there has to be a minimum amount of energy that you can give a person before you, have say, before you can say that that particular person now has access to modern energy services. And we need to make sure that we don't go below that minimum. So all those different things they talk, I mean, the innovations like the light bottles from um, plastic cups and different things, they're all fine as stop gaps, but you certainly haven't given anybody energy once they just have a light point and um, a, charging, a, a charging point. So it's strategic planning that I keep on emphasizing in this area.
Absolutely, very, very valid point, Inka. With that, just going up from that, would that, would that mean that the energy transition dilemma or, or the context from which we argue from an ag African point of view, it's such that we're not necessarily dealing with a conflict between fossil fuel or renewable, but we're dealing with more substantial energy governance concerns. Would that, would that be a right conclusion to make? I think so first and foremost, I think so first and foremost, we're dealing with energy government governance um, issues, we're dealing with energy mix issues as well. And we need to put everything in context and see what we can do and what um, we cannot do, what is feasible. I don't think you need to throw away the oil completely. There's a lot, Nigeria is making a case for natural gas, but it's making a case for natural gas premised on what? Yeah, it has to be premised on something. And again, it's strategic planning we're talking about. Thank you very much. Very insightful point. Uh, just to bring you in here, Tavis, and perhaps you could um, uh, add to that um, uh, in following this question. African countries, and, and again, I've tried to stay away from the controversies on energy transition in some of the discussions that, that you find on, on a number of platforms, social media and even other academic platforms. African countries and expats have this notion or this view that there is a global energy transition that's somewhat imposed on Africa. In essence, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an energy transition that Africa didn't particularly contribute to redefining. How, how do you respond to that? I agree with that comment, actually. I think um, particularly, again, uh, just drawing upon my, my, my former student's work, David Adigo, I, I'm not sure if he's able to come on in, in this, this format, but one of, one of David's findings from his PhD um, and, and his publications he's producing, so I encourage you to, to keep an eye out for these, uh, is in, in the context of the green economy transition in Ghana, that the whole idea, we're talking about a green economy as opposed to an energy transition in particular, but that the concept, some of these concepts have been imposed from the outside, particularly from, from, from the, the global north. And what we need is a, is a flipping, a flipping of that model where the, the, the visions and the approaches for transition are grown domestically, grown from the actors in those spaces. And they they are legitimate, and they are the, they are the visions that drive transformation. The the vision for energy transition in in different countries and regions and spaces in Africa needs to be one that's driven from the bottom up, and and that is the only way it will work, is by a, an inclusive vision that's driven from the bottom up. It will not work. And nor, nor should we be doing that. So I think there's the, this is brings in the energy justice aspects as well of, of the transition and why justice is so central to this, both sort of restorative justice and distributive justice. We have to ensure these visions are grown from the ground up and are enacted from the ground up. But that also involves reforms to things such as institutions and governance, which have been problematic. Thank, thank you very much, uh, um, Tavis. Um, and so this is this is another question from um, Millicent um, Ellen, and, and it's directed to to Yinka. But by all means, um, other members of of the panel are, are, are absolutely free to 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 share their thoughts. And she says, "Do you think that in just industrialized countries in Europe, in industrialized countries of of Europe, North America, etc., can ever claim to reach net zero target?" When their companies, e.g., oil and gas companies and auto industry, are emitting in huge, huge measures in Africa, don't you think that net zero targets ought to be redefined to factor this in? To factor this in, since these companies ultimately take their profits home to further enrich their industrialized countries. What are your thoughts, uh, Professor Morley? Okay, um, thank you. In fact, I read this in chat. I thought again it was another great question. I will first face the West. Before I do, I'll say anyway, where you have country targets and country commitments, it is the business of the host country to ensure that its citizens, including its corporate citizens, actually comply with um, whatever its obligations are. Now, if you look around, you'll see a lot of that is happening. A lot of companies are suddenly changing from being oil and gas to energy. They're not just doing that for semantic reasons. There are sound principles and sound pressures that are making them do that. A lot of companies are also divesting 
from Africa, from Nigeria, for example, has companies that are de facto divesting. By the time you sell off your onshore assets, you're actually divesting to a greater extent. So we need to realize that the pressure is on already. The environmentalists are not waiting for the government to, do, to, to pressurize. They are putting themselves in boards publicly placed boards and making sure that they have a voice. So there's big pressure. What we need to think about in Africa is what's gonna happen with the vacuum, because I don't think that same pressure exists for Chinese companies. So we need to be afraid that that just might happen in, in, in that sense, but I don't want us to underemphasize the move. There's a big push that's uh, going forward. So again, it's back to us making sure we protect ourselves. You sell, if we sell to the Chinese everything, we might end up being the most polluted place. Thank you, thank you very much for that insightful um, um, response. Um, I, I was going to um, ask this question to Professor Tavis Pons. And, and essentially, drawing from your experience in the UK and, and Aberdeen, um, Scotland more specifically, um, you see a lot in terms of innovation and technology driving um, you know, energy transition um, in, in this part of the world um, through hydrogen, blue, and, and all of that, and, and carbon capture and, and storage technologies being, being advanced here, floating offshore wind turbines. Um, how do you think African countries can perhaps look within to have a more organic, I would say, contribution to the energy transition um, agenda? Again, I think this comes back to um, my earlier point about homegrown innovation and and so developing uh the national systems of innovation in within countries and within regions of africa uh ensuring that simply comes down to ensuring that there is a lot of investment in the educational base for example we we uh i don't want to so underwrite what we do here in the university we have a, a fantastic diaspora students who come to us from all over the world and we train them and we send them back and we have fantastic alumni networks for example all through africa of students who have trained here but what about training in Africa? What about training in those different countries of developing the innovation, developing the expertise, whether it is through solar or through wind or through hydrogen or through carbon capture and storage, those homegrown networks, really developing your own capacity. The issue in, in I want to come back to the issue in South Africa around coal, for example. Now there are major questions there. There are major resistances of coal workers to transition in Africa because coal, uh, the coal industry is essentially a, a state owned uh, uh, sector, which provides a level of security despite its, its enormous carbon emissions. There is actually resistance to global firms coming in and providing renewable opportunities in South Africa because of the potential uncertainty that provides an employment and shifting from coal to these renewable sectors. So here is a great spot for what are the homegrown options? What are the homegrown technologies and solutions? Can, for example, communities own their own sources of energy, own their own energy infrastructures? What is the role of community energy in a diversified and decentralized grid as an option, as an alternative to coal in South Africa as a part of that transition? So the emphasis here is on developing innovation capacity domestically and internally and ensuring that provides your base for going forward. All right, thank you. Um, Professor Omerbe, yeah, do you want to add I, to I would like to add and say that, yes, we do need that capacity right now, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's so much outside. I, I'm doing a lot of work in that area now. There are, and it's a known fact there that there's so many technologies already that are at some point in time. So there are a lot of them that we can utilize, but we do need to manage them well. And so again, once more, I want to talk about things that have to do with management and policy and planning and ensuring that we are able to actually effectively own what it is that we are given. So to that extent, I think that um, I, I, I will agree, but if we're going to start from the beginning, it's going to set us back. There's too much happening in the world right now. Absolutely, we valid point. And, and use it. Absolutely, very valid point, Professor Yinka Omorogwe. And, and we do see China, you know, surprising everyone and um, now owning close to 80% 
of of the manufacturing of, of offshore wind turbines we see mm -hmm. and so there's that opportunity to sort of uh, leapfrog and i think that that kind of ties into tt's question of the role of technology transfer and intellectual property rights in energy transition and, and, mm -hmm. and i don't know if you want to speak to that um professor yeah, yes in fact i saw that because i mean it is key technology is key you find that when you're talking about renewables if they drive down the cost of the batteries, it will help drive down the costs of renewable energy to a great um, extent. And there's so much happening in that area. There's so much happening to try and ensure that diesel or petroleum doesn't remain a backup for solar to ensure that you can have 24 hour solar. So there's so much happening all over the place. It's driven by technology. We've got to tap tap into it, we can be building ourselves up in research, we'll be very useless in that area generally. We'll build ourselves and tap into what is existing right now so we don't get left behind. Absolutely valid, valid point. And COVID does provide a number of indications and lessons from that as to why we need to build from, from within. Um, Tavis, please go ahead. Just a brief, we we'll get a lesson from Scotland, I think, in this where we are, we are you know, developing the technological innovation expertise. But our main problem in Scotland is that we, we're not building anything here. We don't have the manufacturing base for offshore wind. In fact, nearly all offshore wind farms around the UK are built in, in other countries and exported to Scotland. So if we are to actually have the benefits of, of the energy transition and the jobs that come with it, we're not, we can't just be a, a construction and service side of it. We need to have the whole cycle of mm -hmm. it, including the manufacturing and the service uh, and, 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 the, and sorry, the construction and the service of that sector to really recognise the full gains. And, and actually our, our, our ambitions for jobs are, are stratospheric, but actually our employment in, in offshore in, 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 in renewable energies is actually starting to flatline a little bit. So the difference between now and there is building it. Absolutely. Very, very valid point there. Um, and just to bring in Dr. King here, um, in, a number of scholars have, have made the argument that, you know, so much, a, a lot of billions of dollars will be required for energy transition in Africa and globally. And if you look very closely at the controversies that surrounded the Campbell oil field um, discourse between the Prime Minister, the First Minister, Nicholas Sporgen, and um, the head of the oil and gas UK. Um, the tension was that perhaps, you know, we might need to some pause with oil so that we get the money to then transition. And that is an argument that a number of African countries have touted. How, how, how valid is that, that we continue with oil to get the money to transition? Well, uh... <laughs> I mean, I do believe that solutions for Africa must come from Africa and not from the West. And I think one of the key challenges of trying to implement energy um, transition in Africa, of course, is financing. And if you look at the cost, this cost could actually reach close to $300 billion for Africa. So while more advanced economies are kind of pledged to support projects within their own context, right, and also perhaps by extension globally, right, the cumulative flow to Africa is often relatively low. So, and I think financing again from an advanced economic context shouldn't be the same. They shouldn't use the same channels that they use for funding. I think funding should be earmarked to climate change related projects to kind of ensure that the investments are fast tracked. So well, I, I, I think my, my own approach to it, and I think coming from an entrepreneurial lens, because I, I, I'm an entrepreneur and I've done a lot of stuff on entrepreneurship is for Africa to kind of look at some kind of sustainable business models. And a sustainable business model is one that kind of creates value for its stakeholders without depleting the financial and economic social capital. Now, but sustainable business models without understanding entrepreneurship is difficult because one, there's an interplay. And what you're seeing in Africa and perhaps in Nigeria is some kind of pioneering efforts in driving that kind of sustainable efforts. Why would you recognize that financing is a problem? There is a need to kind of see how we can actually also support sustainability efforts within our, economy, our community, within, uh, within our context. I'll stop at that. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, time, please. Just a quick comment. Um, I'd say look at the track record to date. Really, follow the money to date. Has, has the, the global development of, or, or the national development of the oil and gas industry 
provided um, solutions to issues of social, environmental, and economic inequality. It, it, I think the track record is very patchy to date on that. Even in in in, in advanced economies of Scotland that we can see in places like Aberdeen, the benefits of the energy industry has flowed to certain groups of people in certain places over expense of others. So we often hear this debate about we need we need the income uh, from the oil and gas industry transition. I don't think necessarily that we do, particularly in the era of of increasingly environmental, social, and governance criteria into the international finance markets and climate investment. So I think there is a, there is a question there to ask about that, and, and genuinely, if that is there a link between those two things? Thank, thank you very much. I mean, I was listening, I was watching, looking at the news today, and I saw that Elon Musk is now wealthier than Exxon Mobil. Um, so so it, it does bring to the fore the the role of entrepreneurship. Um, I, I think this this question comes from um, Dr. Peter Moesi, and, and it kind of leads to the political will um, element of, of, of the whole issue. And he says, it would seem that African leaders or people are very much aware of the energy problems and solutions are not far-fetched. Nigeria, but how can a people know so much about the problems with possible solutions, but somehow these problems appear unsurmountable. Um, Professor Inka, do you, do you want to take that? I think the answer to that is, is, is very, very complex. But first, I would say that the people know a lot less than you think, because um, they just haven't bothered to mm. work in that way. I mean, so often energy is the thing that is left behind when people mm. are talking, and that has happened. Um, that has happened for a long time. So I think what we need to do is amplify our voices and make it apparent. And that's why I think net zero is great because it's throwing up all these issues and suddenly making all of them say, oh, we have so many energy poor. Mm. They probably didn't know before, you know. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much. I mean, we could, we could absolutely go um, on and on and on, on this conversation. And we, we absolutely um, look forward to, to other opportunities to continue to engage. I, I don't think there's an end to this, um, as long as um, energy poverty continues to be um, a, a, a great concern. Um, at this point, um, I, I want to invite um, Professor John Patterson um, to provide us with some, um, with, with some closing remarks. Um, Professor John Patterson trained as a solicitor in the office of the Solicitor Secretary of State for Scotland. He is um, a you know, well-known energy and natural resource governance expert um, and has worked on a number of projects in hydrogen, in oil and gas, consulted for a number of companies. And um, he, he's, he's very happy to share some of his thoughts on the issue in the form of some closing remarks. So over to you, Professor John Patterson. Many thanks, Eddie. I'll be very brief. Uh, I must begin by saying I'm really humbled to be asked to contribute to this Black History Month event. Uh, I'm also really lucky and privileged uh, throughout my career to have worked with uh, many PhD and master's students uh, and colleagues from Africa. And I've also been lucky uh, to visit a number of countries uh, in that continent. Now, we've had today, as you know, some excellent presentations from leading academics, Professor Yinka Umarugbe, Dr. King Omehi, Professor Tavis Potts, and very ably chaired by you, Eddie. So thank you very much indeed. Um, let me just say that on, on one of my visits to Nigeria a few years ago, uh, I was asked to participate in a, a stakeholder conference uh, in Abuja involving governments uh, and uh, communities affected by the oil industry. And I saw Professor Umarogbe in action at that event. And it's really just a, a simple statement of fact that over the two days of that conference, uh, to my mind, hers was really the most effective intervention. And that's because she had no fear in speaking truth to power. Uh, and in that sense, I think Professor Umarogbe is really a fantastic role model for us uh, in terms of what is really going to be required of us in the months and years ahead. So some of the key messages I've taken from our event this evening uh, the importance of understanding history uh, and the need to fight to ensure that that history is known and understood, because unfortunately, as we know today, there are plenty of forces that would attempt to suppress that truth. 
Uh, the fact that the energy trilemma, even if difficult, is not impossible to resolve. Solving the energy poverty uh, problem is uh, really entirely consistent with responding to climate change and ensuring energy security. Uh, another point, the fact that the necessary transition involves investment opportunities, not charitable costs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the need to ensure that the transition is just. Uh, and the fact that that involves the relocation of economic control. So it's really fundamental change. And of course, the massive infrastructure change involved in moving from fossil fuels to renewables. So taken together, my sense is really that this implies not simply uh, an energy transition, but an energy transformation. And indeed, Tavis spoke of the gold standard being a transformative, uh, just transition. So I think the question for us as we, as we leave this evening is, will we take the necessary steps to affect transformational change to resolve the energy trilemma in a way that is just, or will we have destructive transformational change imposed upon us by the planet that we have asked too much from? So this is a global challenge, which implies a genuine partnership. Uh, and I hope that this Black History Month event can really serve as a model for the necessary ongoing dialogue and action. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much and back to you, Eddie. Thank you very much, Professor John Patterson. And thank you very much, everyone who has taken out time to join us today, engage with the conversation, provide us with insights, questions, and a very many thanks to Professor Yinka Omarigwe, um, Professor Tavis Port, and Dr. King for sharing a really, really sincere um, 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 interaction and, and insights into this topic. I mean, this is a conversation that is very close to my heart. And um, we started the conversation under the African Natural Resource and Energy Law Network, which, which a few of us um, came together to form in 2019. Um, and we had a really excellent conference here at the University of Aberdeen at that time. And we look forward, say, for the pandemic, and hopefully we should be looking forward to um, more in-person interactions in the years to come, um, fingers crossed. Um, I, I do look forward to us engaging with this issue and perhaps as much as we can move even to the African continent and interact directly. And that was some of the points Inca made as to visit um, these locations, visit the continent and interact so that we don't have an energy, energy transition that is imposed on us, but one that is organic, one that is transformative, and one that I hope is revolutionary. At this point, I want to say thank you, everyone, and do have a pleasant evening. Bye for now. Thank you.